Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, testing. Playlist. Yeah, let me pull that up. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oop, there we go. Sorry, guys. Um, I thought I was talking to you, but I wasn't. So, yeah, the playlist is... Um, they're all songs by an artist named Wataboy. W-A-T-A-B-O-I. Um, the, uh, um, the tracks themselves are Cali, You Said It, and Flavor. So if you wanna if you wanna go grab those, I found them on a uh, one of these uh, stream like these sites for background music, royalty free for your stream. So yeah, um, yeah, I'm not you know this isn't a Twitch stream. This is a YouTube stream. Slightly different thing, um, but yeah. Please, 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 if you're watching this, please subscribe to my channel uh, because. Currently, I'm sitting at 750 subs, and if I manage to push that up to 1,000 subs, I get to monetize my old videos, and then I actually, like, get money for a thing, things that I've al already done, uh, which, you know, I would never, I would never, like, put ads on a stream that I'm currently doing for a class I'm currently teaching, because I'm already getting paid by the university to do this, right? But, uh, I don't see any reason why I shouldn't be able to make a little bit of a scratch off of my old videos, uh, except, of course, that I don't have enough subs, so... Thank you very much if you've been subscribing. Um, ah, um, yeah, so one of the things about YouTube chat is they won't let you post links. But uh, if you want the slides, uh, I can I can just tell you where those are. Um, it's under Avenue Content Slides. So, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Sponsored by, uh, what is it? Uh, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends, the 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 game that has people in it. Ha! Anyway, so anyway, yeah, I gotta make like that twelve cents a week off of the ad revenue, man. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> play it, yeah. <laughs> 30 second ad <admin> lecture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would never do that to you. I have more respect for you than that. But uh, anyway. So, hello, favorite class of mine. That's right. Dropping it right there. Mechatronics. As a forward Mechatronics guy myself, Mechatronics has to be my favorite class. Um, <laughs> um, it's like you're watching, a, you're watching a, a lecture on English grammar and an ad for Grammarly comes up. Anyway, um, so, we're going to get into our actual course material today. Uh, to my brain, I do not believe, I do not believe in my brain there are any announcements, but I suppose I should, I should actually check that before I, uh, shoot my mouth off about there being no announcements, eh? Avenue. I have a new, I have a secondary screen now, so I can just, you know, enter my password without anybody seeing it. Okay, one... Two, three, four. There we go. Oops, did I say that on screen? That's a joke. My password isn't really one, two, three, four. Error establishing a database connection. Strange. Okay. Weird. Has anybody else ever gotten a database error on Avenue before? Very weird. Well, if Avenue's down, then that's the course. Hope you guys enjoyed the one lecture of it. But, uh, anyway. We're gonna talk about C programming today. Um... Today's going to be like a classic introductory lecture where I um, go through some of the interesting points about C that everybody was asking about uh, during the last lecture during, while we were discussing the uh, syllabus. So, yeah, for some reason, Avenue's just not letting me in right now. Maybe it's because I'm also streaming. Who the heck knows? Not me. Oh, well. Let me bring that back up. Woof. <clears throat> Anyone have any good Linux distro suggestions? Well, I'm running uh, Mint with the cinnamon uh, skin on it right now, and I quite like it. 
Um, yeah, there are no assignments under GitLab. The slides are not on Avenue. Well, that's interesting. Um, you can't log into Avenue right now either. Well, I guess um, I'll just do this then with the slides I have and uh, with you guys... I guess once Avenue comes back online, it seems like it's a it seems like it might be a not just a me thing, which is interesting. But when Avenue comes back online, you'll have your slides, hopefully. And if not, I'll put them up there, but they should be up there. I can't see why they wouldn't be up there. Uh, I'm pretty sure I put them up there, but um <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll, uh, I, I'll, you know, I'm assuming everybody's old enough to ignore spam in the comments, but, uh, anyway. So, anyway, let's, let's just get into the lecture then. We've wasted enough time! All right, so, this is, uh, computer science, computer science. Software engineering. Ooh, I forgot to update that. Last year it was software engineering. This year it's mechatronics. That was interesting, actually. That was like one of the suggestions that I gave the department after having run the course. It's for Tron people, so why isn't it called the Tron course? And they uh, they decided to change it. So. Do, 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 do. Um, it seems like... There's a there's an inconsistency. Some people can log into Avenue and some can't. It'll probably resolve itself in like an hour or so. So let's just do our lecture and have fun. So software versus hardware. I'm sure a number of you are already familiar with what software and hardware are, but let's uh, let's talk. Let's bring our understanding of software hard and hardware into a somewhat more formal formulation. So, hardware. What is it? It's a collection of physical electronic components that comprise a computer's physical form, and software is a series of instructions stored in a computer's memory that may be executed by some by sometimes arbitrary software systems. A processor is a group of circuits that implement operations on memory, and these operations are known as either instructions or hardware instructions. Um so, I'm sure, ba way back in uh, elementary school, they told you what a computer was, what a computer is made of. You've got your processor and you've got your memory. This is also known as the von Neumann model of architecture. Programming languages are more or less abstract depending on how directly they access the system's underlying hardware. So the more abstract your programming language is, essentially there's a, a correspondence between the number of instructions, uh, hardware instructions per line of code and the high levelness of that programming language. You've got, so basically you've got two categories. You've got high level languages, such as Python and Haskell. Uh, these, uh, in, in something like Python, one single statement may be represented by a large number of hardware instructions. In low-level languages, such as C, uh, one operation, like one statement in C, represents comparatively few hardware instructions. One of the things that's interesting about C is that it has quite a stable uh, mapping from C into object code, uh, whereas something like Python, you've got, uh, you know, dynamic correctness checking going on, and you've got all kinds of, you know, things running in the background inside of the interpreter that mean that a Python program isn't, like, a Python program doesn't run, like, bareback on the CPU, right? It's running inside of the Python interpreter. Whereas, when you are writing a C program, you are writing a program directly for the CPU. It gets compiled to hardware instructions. Those hardware instructions get executed with no intermediary layer. Uh, yes, there might be the occasional spelling mistake in this. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Lanug edges. Yes, pardon me. Um, so, low-level languages run much more directly on top of the processor than do high-level languages. Different languages are, of course, good for different things, and a good developer always knows which languages are best suited to which applications. So, that question... The question then becomes, all right, so what is the applicability of a low-level language? Given that, I have heard that uh, low-level languages are much more um, difficult to work with than high-level languages, which is not completely true, but it is to some degree true. Um, why would we go to the trouble of learning a low-level language? And the answer is, of course, applications. Applications. Some non-traditional programming environments, such as microcontrollers, which should be of particular interest to you people as Mechatronics students, uh, do not support high-level languages. Um, if you... Ah, yes. So, um, you can't, you can't post links in the chat, because this is YouTube chat. Um, so here's, here's an idea. Um, like, spell out the URL and, like, change some of the characters. Maybe you can trick it into thinking that there's a, that it's not a URL when it, when it is. Um, so, yes. If you're working on a microcontroller, normally microcontrollers are small enough that they, they are not going to support, like, more than one programming language. Normally, if you're if you're working on like single purpose hardware like that, well, it's not single purpose. You know what I mean. If you're working on a if you're working on a um, a microcontroller, very often supporting extra languages for that microcontroller is going to be that's going to increase the size of the microcontroller. And the whole point of a microcontroller is that it is as small as is humanly possible. Uh, normally, C programs and like the environment that's used for C's, uh, for C programs, um, it's sufficiently memory uh, efficient that it's one of the default choices for these types of, you know, very very small pro like embedded systems. So, also optimization. Because they use a small number of hardware instructions per operation, programs written for low-level languages can be very, very small. Uh, relative, uh, no... Yeah, I think that works. Um, I don't know. You guys figure it out. <clears throat> programs written for low-level languages can be very small in terms of memory, in terms of size, uh, and they can run very quickly relative to high-level languages. Some optimizations are not possible in high-level languages. Uh, I was talking to uh, one of the uh, computer science, uh, one of the computer science students in uh, the 3MI3 stream said just yesterday that uh, they were working at one point uh, for a co-op or something, and they re-implemented um, part of a vision processing library. I forget which one. But it was written in Python, and they ported it to C++, and they saw a 500% uh, efficiency increase by just moving from Python to C++. And C++ is, like, it's got a lot more going on than just C. So you can imagine there would also be a speed-up bonus uh, by moving from C++ to C. Although not so much as moving from Python to C++. Some optimizations are not possible in high-level languages. One of the things that C gives you um, is the ability to directly control the memory management of your program. Memory management is not something that you will need... It's not something that you need to know about if you're programming in Python, but if you don't know of memory management, you can't program in C. Memory management is going to be a topic that we cover uh, reasonably extensively during this course. But, um, <clears throat> basically, you can do some interesting and cool things with memory when you have direct control over it that's, um, 
you know, Python wouldn't let you do it, basically. Um, and because Python's running so many checks on memory in the background, it's never going to be as efficient. Reason number three, knowledge. An appreciation for what our programs are doing under the hood will make us better programmers, hypothetically speaking. <clears throat> so, just as a reminder, or perhaps perhaps you guys never covered this in the first place, this is the von Neumann architecture. You have an input device, you have an output device, and you have the computer itself. The computer itself consists consists of the central processing unit, or CPU, interacting with the memory unit. Uh, the mem In the computers, we have, you know, several memory units. Um, your hard disk, or SSD, that is your permanent memory storage. Your RAM is your impermanent memory, random access memory, read-only memory. Uh, in addition to these, you also have things like register memory inside of the CPU and swap memory, which, uh, which or cache memory, which is like adjacent to the CPU, but not, not a register in the CPU. It's like very, very fast, very volatile memory. Generally speaking, there is a... Uh, uh, the trade-off with memory is you have volatile memory uh, and you have involatile memory. When it's volatile, it has it's much more likely to decay over time. So you get like random bits flipping and your data breaks down over time in volatile memory. In uh, involatile memory, your data stays much, much, much longer, uh, you know, on the order of, you know, you know, decades or whatever, whatever the expected lifespan of a, of a hard drive is. But the thing that, like the price that you pay for that, the trade-off, is you, um, you pay for it in speed, right? Volatile memory uh, decays quickly, but you can write to it very, very quickly. Whereas with uh, involatile memory, it takes a lot longer for the, for the data to start breaking down, but it also takes longer to write any, anything to it. That's why, you know, when you've run out of memory, your computer slows way down because your, your operating system will start using portions of your hard drive as uh, RAM when you run out of RAM, which is good because it means you don't, you know, your programs don't crash because you're out of memory, but it's bad because it starts to take a whole heck of a lot longer to perform your, uh, to, to do anything, really, because you're having to go to much slower memory to be able to do that. But yeah, so within the uh, CPU itself, you've got two basic categories of circuit. You've got control circuits, which organize how memory is loaded, how instructions are loaded, and how those instructions are executed. And you have the arithmetic logic unit, uh, or the ALU, the ALU actually performs operations such as addition and subtraction. Um, so the control unit loads stuff into and out of the ALU, and the ALU itself performs the... Uh, hmm. What happens if your H HDD is full and you run out of RAM? Uh, then you should uh, close the 300 instances of Minecraft that you have running. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> you would get an out-of-memory exception. Uh, it's pretty... It's pretty rare these days. It used to happen a lot more back in the days of, like, Windows 3.1 or Windows 95. But, uh... You would get... You would get a... You would get an error. It might cause a, uh... It might cause your computer to need a hard reset. Or perhaps it would just, like... Everything would start breaking. So this is what would happen if you actually ran out of memory. Programs that requested memory would be denied their request. Uh, <laughs> so, um, like, if I have, like, my Sid Meier's Civilization 4 game, which is the best Civilization game, and it's requesting, you know, X amount of memory, um, 
the uh, the process would be denied to that request. Now, how that gets handled by the program depends on how the program is written. Some programs would probably just sit and wait for memory to become available, because they're going to assume that memory does become available some, at some point. So maybe it would be recoverable by, like, you closing some of your 3,000 instances of Minecraft that you have open, but, uh, you know, I could see it causing a hard crash. I could see it ha cl having a hard crash. Um, what causes memory to be volatile or non-volatile? It has, yeah, it has to do, that's exactly correct. It has to do with the physical means that the data is being stored in. So, this is kind of beyond the scope of this course, but, um, <laughs> um, Civ 4. Civ 4 is the best Civ. I'm sorry, I will fight you to, the, like, this is the hill that I will die on. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, no, yeah, what I should be saying is, like, if you have a Minecraft, if you have Minecraft running and a computer running inside of Minecraft and having Minecraft running on the computer that's inside of Minecraft and having a Minecraft running on the computer that you built inside of the computer, you're running on Minecraft that inside of the computer that you're running Minecraft on, I could see you having memory problems. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, volatile memory, basically it's... Um, it all comes down to the way that the things are stored. Like, registers are just stored um, using flip-flops, which are, um, they're kind of like, they're, they're in the same neighborhood of, uh, as, like, AND and OR gates. So if you, if you, you know, arrange your AND and OR gates, your logic gates in, together in a particular fashion, you get what's called a flip-flop. That's the most volatile memory. Um, whereas if you, you know, on down the line, if you go to something like flash memory or an actual magnetic disk, um, like, these are things that the memory inside of them stays even through powering off, right? So, volatile memory, the memory certainly won't stay through a, through a power cycle. But yeah, um... <laughs> Um, my big gripe with, like, Civ 5 and Civ 6 is that they stopped, uh, they, they stopped mathematical complexity, and they, uh, they increased description, descriptional cap, uh, complexity. Also, I, I have a, I have a problem with the amount of time it takes to finish a game in Civ 4, uh, or in Civ 5. In Civ 4, I could finish a game of Civ 4 in, like, four or five hours, but with uh, Civ 5, at least, you're looking at at least 40 hours, and, like, a busy guy like me ain't got the time, you know? Um, anyway. So, uh, memory. We already kind of talked about this. I have, you'll notice that I have a, uh, I have a horrible tendency to, like, get ahead of the slides and talk about the next slide when I should just bring up the next slide. I'll try to, I'll try to not. Uh, <laughs> so, um, computer memory is stored primarily in re uh, read-only memory, permanent data storage. The files in your file system are stored in ROM. Physically, this is normally a magnetic hard drive, solid state drive, or flash memory, such as a USB drive. This is your permanent memory. Um, random access memory is your system's working memory. On execution, programs are loaded into the ROM, uh, ro sorry, loaded from the ROM into the RAM. So when you execute your C program, it is loaded from your, your hard drive into your RAM for execution. Registers. Memory storage internal to the CPU. Data must be loaded into registers in order for the CPU to perform operations on it. So the CPU can only directly operate on stuff that's stored inside of the CPU, as the, you might expect. So a great deal of circuitry is dedicated to just getting the correct memory out of the RAM and into the registers, and then putting it back again. Like, half of your operations are memory moving, or moving memory around. The data we access in memory, in system memory, can be categorized hierarchically. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, Crusader Kings too. Yeah, I've heard about Crusader Kings, but uh, I kind of have a pro. Like, I have the problem that I have with the Sid Meier games and them taking too long is like multiplied by a factor of ten for anything done by Paradox. Um, I like I love their games in concept, but I just don't have the time to play them. Um, like Stellaris is really good. I wish I had the time to play it. You know. Um. Yeah, CD-ROM is compact disc read-only memory. DVD-ROM is like data video disc random acts uh, uh, read-only memory. Yeah, you're learning. Ha ha. You learned it and you didn't even realize you were learning. Ha ha. Anyway, so the bit is the smallest element of memory. It is either a one or a zero. It is the atomic m unit of memory, right? You should know what bits are if you want to do this for a degree program. A byte is made of eight bits. A word, this is this might be interesting. A word varies by CPU. So generally speaking, it's the number of bits a CPU instruction uh, instruction set operates on in a single operation. So, you know, we are currently on 64-bit architecture. 64-bit seems to be good enough for most things, but, you know, um, is it possible that we will see 128-bit architecture in the future? Absolutely. Absolutely, that's possible. So, the Nintendo Entertainment System was an 8-bit machine, so the words and the bytes were the same size, right? So, one word was one byte. Um... This is why, for example, the Nintendo Entertainment System was only capable of producing, like, you know, 256 colors. Because, you know, the integer, the integer variable that stored a color value was limited to 8 bits. So you only had 256 available to you. Um, the amount of RAM a computer has is like the amount of desk space a student has. It defines the amount of stuff it can work on uh, and with at once. Yes. And just like a student working at a desk, you can only work on one thing that you have open at a time. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, so, the Nintendo 64, on the, on the other hand, was a 64-bit machine. So a word was 8 bytes. Um, it's at that level that you started being able to do um, floating point num. Well, you could do floating point in... Uh, um, you could do floating point in, in the Super Nintendo, I'm pretty sure, because they had, like, the Mode 7 effects and stuff. But uh, with the Nintendo Entertainment System, I'm pretty sure it didn't support, support floating point numbers. Um, but there you go. Maybe it did. It probably did, but it was painful, so nobody used it. So, yeah, the word size is whatever the, uh, whatever the operational size of your CPU is. For most of us, that'll be 64 bits. Uh, they haven't had 32-bit architectures in, like, personal computers since, like, the late 90s, early noughties. So, you know. So, yeah. Um, bits are organized into uh, characters. Characters are organized into fields. Fields into records and records into files, generally speaking. Apple hates four-byte words. Yes. <laughs> so, a computer's character set is used for writing programs and representing data. Uh, you have the influence of the Unix operating system to thank for the fact that most files on your computer are sta stored in plain text. Um, C supports various character sets, including ASCII, UTF-8, and UTF-16. So you could write a C program in, like, UTF-16, but, you know, why you would need to is, you know, a, you know, you, you don't need to when it's C programming. So, fields are composed of characters and other data types. Associated data associates data with a context in order to establish meaning, and records relate several fields that may comp be composed together. So what made 16-bit so much more colorful? Was it just that it had more memory to store those colors? Yes, actually, that's it. That's it entirely. So 256 sounds like a lot 
Uh, but um, it's actually really not when you're talking about all of the colors that could possibly exist. Once you have 16-bit color, um, you're allowed, like, you now have a whole heck of a lot more gradations in color, so you can do shading properly. Uh, it also had to do with um, the Nintendo Entertainment System, the way that the sprites worked in the, in the NES. Um, I'm pretty sure that no sprite could have more than four colors, and there was, like, one background color for a scene. So, um, that's why, for example, Mario's, um, like, um... Like, Mario's boot color is the same as his skin color on his face, or something like that. Um, if you look at old NES sprites, you'll see that, like... Like, if you look at the Final Fantasy site, sprites, those are all, like, two colors. It's amazing. Anyway, what is UTF-8? UTF-8 is a uh, uh, universal text format, I think, or something. Uh, 16. So, basically, it's the extended character set that includes, like, all of the characters in, you know, like, Cyrillic and... Chinese and Japanese and um, all of your emojis are in that. It's like you need one code for each character. Um, eight bits is not enough. You ASCII is actually only a seven bit uh, format. So, you know, every bit you add doubles the number of characters you can have. And we haven't used up all of the address space in type inside of UTF-16. So that'll be around for a while. Um, How does a bunch of electronic signals become a character? Um, <laughs> you gotta... Uh, that's, that's too complicated a question for me right now. Uh, <laughs> um, magic. Yeah. What are we going to use when we start to program? What application are you using? Uh, whatever you want, really. Um, I'm going to be using something that looks like Notepad in these lectures, so... Uh, you can use Notepad. If you want to use VS Code, that's fine as well. Whatever is comfortable for you. You have the freedom to choose whatever IDE you think is most suitable. Um, using the command line, is it possible to create a file with the size of zero bytes? Does the reference to the file itself take up space? Uh, with enough copying pasted, would it run out of space? Yes, yes, and yes. So, um, yeah, in the command line, where am I? Um teaching to mp3 uh, 2021 fall cd examples like if I touch a file um, random that creates the file random and you'll see that the size of the file is zero because it contains nothing um we don't really need to go over records and fields again, because um, it's not going to be relevant. And uh, you can always run the video back a bit if you miss something I say. I know I, I speak pretty quickly, but all right. So a field is a collection of characters, and a record is a collection of fields, basically. And a file, the way that uh, the textbook describes it at least, is a collection of records. Although, you know, this is... Yeah. Um, if you if you want me to... I, I'm not going to re-explain stuff because you can always run the video back. Um, so, a database is a collection of data organized for easy access and manipulation. The most popular model for is the relational database in which data is stored in simple tables. A table contains a n number of records which contains a number of fields. So, that's... That, the point of that was just to sort of give you some context for data. Now let's talk about... Oh, jeez. All right. I'm too aggressive. There. That'll be funny to watch. Um, so, let's talk about the C programming language itself. The thing that we're actually here for. C evolved from two previous languages, BCPL and B. So C is the evolution of B, if you can imagine that. BCPL is the basic combined programming language and was developed in 1967 by Martin Richards, 
as a language for writing operating system software and compilers. Um, hmm. So, yeah, any of any text editor will work. Um, so, Ken Thompson modeled many features of his B language after their counterparts in BC8PL. And in 1970, he used B to create early versions of the Unix operating system at Bell Laboratories. It's kind of funny because, um, was there an A? Probably. Uh, my, uh, I, I would have to look it up. Probably way off into the ancient, into the ancient ana uh, annals of history, there was a B, there was an A language. But, um, the, um, the development of C as a programming language is inextricably linked to the development of Unix as an operating system. So these, like BCPL and B, were used to create Unix. Unix was then create used to create the C programming, the, like the C compiler. Um, once they had the C compiler, and they were like, wow, this is a much better language than B or BCPL, they began re-implementing uh, Unix in C. So eventually, the the Unix kernel got rewritten for C, and everything else got rewritten for C, and C was the language of Unix. Uh, and, of course, Linux is, like, free Unix, right? It's Unix, but without all of the, like... Unix, but not owned by a company, so they're not, they're not worried about the copyright on it, which has led to the proliferation of Unix operating systems that we now see, right? Uh, when will we be able to code in D? Uh, now, there is a language D-sharp that you can, uh, which is an evolution of C-sharp. So yeah, there is, a, there is a D language that you can learn if you want. Um, yeah. So, the C language was evolved from B by Dennis Ritchie at Bell Laboratories and was originally implemented in 1972. Next year, C, the language, will be 50 years old. 50, five, zero. It's amazing that it's still in use. C initially became widely known as the development language of the Unix operating system. Unix, so the reason Unix won the operating system war of the 70s is because um, the, um, like, AT&T and Bell Laboratories, the licensing deal for Unix was originally very, very generous, particularly for academic institutions. They were basically giving away Unix. And essentially, that meant that an entire generation, uh, like, possibly the most important generation of programmers, those that were trained in the 70s and worked in the 80s, um, these guys were all trained on Unix operating systems. So, um, eventually, uh, you know, AT&T got greedy and started, like, clamping down on the licensing for Unix, which caused everybody else to be like, well, you know what? I'm a programmer. I know how to write programs and stuff. I could re-implement this. And so they did. And uh, that's where you get stuff like Linux from and uh, OpenBSD, OpenSUSE, and all of these other types of, uh, all these other operating systems. Unix. Um, yeah, so it's, Unix is an operating system. It stands for the uh, Uniplexed Networked, um, something something i don't know i i know that the u stands for uniplexed um but yeah it's an operating system so you know what is an operating system an operating system is something that allows your software to communicate with your hardware how does one ah people you've got so many deep questions and i only have so much time how does one create a programming language you start with a grammar you implement a compiler there you go. You have a language. Um, many of today's leading operating systems are written in C or C++. Um, C is mostly hardware independent. That was actually one of the biggest, uh, that was one of the biggest advantages of C 
at the time. Um, basically, um, prior to C and Unix and the uh, sort of standardization of programming, when you had a program and you wanted to port it from one type of computer to another type of computer, you had to re-implement the whole program. Normally, this was because um, each, each computer vendor would package with their computer a compiler that, you know, it's like, okay, so I've got the, you know, I've got the ZX37A, and for the ZX37A, I've got, you know, Pascal and Fortran with these extensions. And the extensions, like, basically every vendor would do their own language extensions, which they thought were useful because they thought that was the selling point of their of their computer, was the language extensions, right? Um, but, you know, if you actually used any of the extensions, and it's never, it's, it was never quite obvious what was an extension and what wasn't, um, your program, it became impossible for you to take your program and put it on anybody else's computer. So, so programs were not highly portable in the th way that we think about programs now. C changed this. Um, C was the first one of the first languages to have um, to have a different model of organization for uh, how the language came into existence. So rather than uh, rather than having like you know a sort of standard C like rather than having like the Pascal that everybody has and then everybody has their extensions on it, there was one unified C uh, specification and if you uh, like so like they wrote the C specification different companies implemented their own compilers for that implemented this specification and then the C people like looked at the compiler and verified that the compiler was um, in accordance with the specification right so they checked to make sure that the C that they were implementing was real C, right? Um, and because they did this, um, because they like they were much more careful about you know the 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 language not getting fragmented by different vendors wanting to make their own version of C. Um, that meant that you could take a file on a computer move it to a different computer and you could recompile that file and it would work which was amazing at the time this caused an explosion in the applicability of computer systems to everyday life it is arguably one of the things that caused the computing phenomenon that rules society to this day the fact that you can move programs between computers um easily quickly and easily in fact it was so good that you can often even move object code between computers. Um, which is to say, uh, you can move an executable file between computers in a lot of cases. But uh, but yeah, so, so that's why C w became very popular. Um, with careful design, it's possible to write C programs that are portable to most computers. So, applications of C. Why C? Because, uh, because of its high performance characteristics, C is still used a lot despite being 50 years old. So, operating systems. Portability across many hardware implementations and overall performance led C, uh, lend C to operating system development. Linux, portions of Windows, and Android use C. Apple's OS X uses Objective-C, which is a derivative of C. Um, so the Linux kernel, roughly speaking, is written in C. It's got some stuff that isn't, but mostly it's C. And Windows as well. So when you're writing an operating system, it's important for the things that you're doing. Uh, it's important for operating system operations to uh, to operate as quickly as quick uh, as as is possible. Right. That's why you need a super 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 fast language like C. Uh, the only thing better would be assembly, but it's complicated enough that you wouldn't want to write it in assembly. Um, embedded systems. 
C is one of the most popular languages for embedded systems development, which are typically highly memory conservative. When you are designing an embedded system, the thing that you want to do is minimize the amount of memory that your uh, that your system uses. You know, um, let's say you're writing a an embedded system for use in a in a car, right? If you can shave off a couple of kilobytes of memory off of your memory chip, right? You can, um, you can, you know, maybe save like, you know, 0 0.2 cents per embedded system. But if you're manufacturing, you know, 10 million cars, then you've just saved the company, you know, $2 million dollars right so that like that's once you start to get into the economies of scale which is where embedded systems often lie um that's like these types of like narrowing down and like pinching your pennies when it comes to memory this can really 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 have an impact when you're when you're manufacturing at scale so what is an embedded system um do i have any to hand um, anything with a computer in it that isn't a computer. I think that's a reasonable de definition. So, like, um, you know your uh, your kitchen timer? You know how you get, like, a digital display and, like, start and stop and all that kind of stuff? That's an embedded system. There is a computer chip in there that is controlling the timer circuit, right? So, it's like you've got a CPU and you've got circuits and you've got buttons, right? But you don't have, like, like it would be ridiculous to run your kitchen timer off of a laptop, right? Um, yeah, coffee machine, embedded system, um, small power computer that can do, yeah. So, like, the number, oh, here's an embedded system. TV remote. That's an embedded system. I did have one to hand. Um, yeah. Like... Charge controllers inside of power charger or power adapters, um, you know, coffee makers, washing machines, uh, refrigerators, ovens. Um, you know, there are like cars now have like over a hundred embedded systems in there. Uh, alarm clocks an embedded system. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, like. Calculators, yeah, calculators and embedded system. Um, <laughs> pro gamers use a gaming PC to run their kitchen timer. Yes, no, uh, that's a waste of resources. Um, yeah, no, like everything, everything is an embedded system. Um, like technically, I guess you could call a, a Game Boy an embedded system. Yeah, uh, Arduinos are embedded systems. Yeah. So. The reason they call it is an embedded system is that you are embedding the system in a circuit. It's like, basically, if you have the ability to control pins, like control pin voltages, if pin voltages are a concern, that's a that's a uh, embedded system. Controllers for video, video games, that's an embedded system. Amazon Echo, I don't know, I think that might be big enough to have an act like a proper operating system. The thing about embedded systems is that they often don't have operating systems, um, so you know. You know, it's not like your kitchen timer runs on Linux. <clears throat> but anyway, more applications. I want to finish this uh, before we finish the class. Real-time systems. These are mission-critical applications which require very fast response times. A high-performance language dramatically increases the feasibility of meeting timing constraints. So a real-time system would be something like, um, you know, the circuits that control the wings of an airplane. It's important whether that happens fast, because if it doesn't happen fast enough, uh, your plane will crash. Communication systems. Due to the massive quantities of data being routed, optimization becomes crucial in communication systems, like cell phone towers. Um, so does that mean some calculators have C running? Yeah, I would actually, I would imagine, well, it depends, right? When you look at embedded systems, um, there's basically two ways that you go with it, right? Um, one is to have a microcontroller, something like an Arduino, 
the other is to just do it as circuitry. Uh, so something like an Arduino is not going to be, um, like it's going to be more expensive than just doing like a, uh, it's called an application specific integrated circuit or ASIC. So if you design a circuit to do the calculator's work, that might, um, you know, that might be more cost effective in the long run, but it also depends. Like something, I would expect something like your Casio, right? Your your twenty dollar Casio scientific calculator. That I would expect to be an embedded, like an embedded system running on something like C, because it's um, it's more robust. But if it's just like one of these um, pocket calculators that just does like add, subtract, multiply, divide, and square root you know, like your elementary school calculator, I would expect that to be a circuit and not actually have a CPU in it. Um, I would expect it to uh, to just be circuitry. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah that's how arithmetic is executed. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if your calculator has programmable memory, it definitely has a CPU in it. Definitely. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'll just end on this slide, which is the popularity of C as a programming language. You'll see, haha, that uh, this light blue line is C. And, you know, this goes back to the year, you know, way back in the before times, in the year 2002. Um... You've got C, pretty consistently one of the most popular programming languages. Now, this um, this measures popularity by the number of people searching uh, how to program the language, right? So, you know, it might just be an indication of how popular C is, you know, in schools, but it's a popular language. It's used a reasonable amount. You'll notice that C++ used to be very popular and is now less popular. And uh, Python has become... Python has basically taken C++'s uh, mantle. Why is there a dip in uh, in 2015? Um, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> like this guy right here? Yeah, I don't know. It's like... I don't know. People were just not searching for it as much, I guess. Um, uh, do I suggest you to do anything before coming to lectures? Uh, no. No. Um, I think, you know, if you're having trouble with the material that... Like, if you have trouble with the material we just covered, then, like, reinforce it. But I don't think there's anything necessarily that you have to do in anticipation of the lecture. Uh, that's not how I've designed the lectures. Like I, it's not like this isn't some uh, this isn't some artsy class where it's like you know read this novel and then we'll talk about it. That's not what this is like. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's your lecture. Uh, we will be resuming class, I think, on Monday? Monday morning, is it, that I've got you guys again? Yes, Monday morning. Yeah, uh, any other questions of any uh, other nature or kind? We kind of got shortchanged this week because uh, Monday there was no class. Although, when I was doing my undergraduate, classes never th started until Thursday of Welcome Week. When do the assignments start? Um, not until, like, next week minimal. Uh, game recommendation. Paradox strategy that can have short play sessions. Oh, Battletech. Turn-based strategy. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Very interesting. Hmm. Giant robots with lasers and cannons in space. 
battle tech. I'll have to remember that. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. <laughs> cool. Um, right. Yeah, this is going to be a fun class. Um, take her easy, folks. Have a good weekend. Will I be continuing this slideshow on Monday, or will we be moving on to the next slideshow? Well, if I if I didn't finish these things, if I had a new slideshow every every lecture, um, I would need to make a lot more slides. Yeah, no, we're going to. Really, is that like a thing? Do professors like expect you to finish the slideshow? That's a uh, that's. I find that bizarre. Um, you guys, it's it's interesting. Y'all have some strange expectations. <laughs> I think you you might have been ruined by uh, by online school if you if you think that like it's acceptable for a professor to tell you to finish half of the slides, you know. Anyway, take her easy, folks. I'll see you guys later. Some professors do. In what department? Is it the math department? Just out of curiosity? Physics. Hmm. Yeah, that would be just like a physicist. Oh, uh, yeah, this class does have office hours. Um, it's uh, uh, 1 30 to 2 30 on Thursdays. ITB 102. Um. <laughs> if you. Good! Oh, thank you, Dorian. Yeah, you're, you're, with, you're, you're with friends. Tron is very cool. Tron is very cool. Yeah, I don't know the professor. I heard some real I heard I heard some real um some some really bad things about how ma the math department was handling things last year. So, you know, watch out for those guys. Like I heard some really bad stories like um there was, like, the second-year calc class, and they, um, like, students were, like, failing the assignments abysmally, so their solution to that was to assign them more assignments. Um, <laughs> not getting lost with integrals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. Hmm. Hmm. It's going to depend very strongly on the professor, I find. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, take her easy, folks. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um... I don't know. That was last year. Possibly things this year are dis different. Hopefully. Um, yeah, it, um, like, in reality, like, I'll be on, like, I'll be on campus specifically to do office hours, so if you're, like, a little bit late or a little bit early, that's, like, not... That's not the end of it. Oh, if you had McLean, then of course it was fantastic, because McLean is, like, one of the best profs ever. Every every prof wants to be McLean. Uh, but anyway, yes. Outro music, etc., etc. Take her easy, folks. Yes. Bye-bye.